Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Prep for Impact. I'm your host, Matt Parrish, former Green Beret, and I got a phenomenal guest for us today. Uh, Red Smith, one of my uh, really good friends, one of my favorite humans on earth. Uh, he's a MARSOC Raider. Before that was in Force Recon, uh, joined the Marine Corps and was a communicator in the, uh, in, in the invasion of Iraq. And it was really interesting to be able to hear, you know, different soft tribes have different uh, kind of training programs and all that stuff. And so it's always interesting to me to hear from a different soft tribe, kind of how they matriculate into becoming, uh, you know, soft quote unquote operators, uh, so to speak. But for Red, it's really interesting because, you know, Marsoc came into existence during his time. And so it's interesting to hear as a guy who was in before Marsoc was formed as Force Recon and then actually being a Marsoc Raider all the way up into our time together at U.S. Special Operations Command on the parachute team and some of the other things we were able to do together. So I know you're going to enjoy this this episode of Prep for Impact from the Green Beret Foundation. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Prep for Impact. As you heard in the intro, got a phenomenal guest for you. One of my favorite humans on earth, Red Smith. Red, good to have you, dude. The lion's mane. If you're not watching this on YouTube, you need to go to YouTube just to see this man's flow. How you doing, bud? Good, buddy. Thanks for having me on. No, thanks for coming, man. You are, uh, you know, I talk about like why I like having a podcast and you are like the perfect example because you and I worked together later in our career. Friends had a, gr a bunch of good times traveling around with the parachute team and all that stuff. But we never work together tactically. And there's never, like, we're never just sitting there. I'm like, Red, tell me why you joined the Marine Corps or tell me a funny story about whatever, right? And so it's, it's cool to be able to sit down with somebody uh, and just kind of chat, right? And yeah. so uh, I will say, I probably already said this in the intro, but I've never had a bad time in my entire life with Red Smith, one of, one of the funnest guys uh, on earth from any soft tribe. So Marine Corps, you joined before MARSOC was a thing. Yeah, yeah. Back exactly. in the days of Force Recon, tell me what makes you want to go into it and how you ultimately get into Force. Uh, so originally the plan was to go Army. Mm. Uh, my dad was a cop and I uh, worked with a couple guys, Rangers and SF guys, but there was an SF guy that was a 20th group National Guard out of Mobile, Alabama. Nice. And so the plan was to do the whole boot camp between 11th and 12th grade. And then use that as a stepping stone out of 20th group to, to get an FSAS uh, slot. Mm -hmm. And then uh, right around 10th grade, a guy moved into town. My dad was on the SWAT team. And uh, this guy was like hawking some gear off that he, that he got out <laughs> of the Marine Corps with. And so we went over there and uh, my dad was in the Navy. I knew all about the SEALs. I knew all about the Army. And uh, he's like, you need to meet this Marine first. I want you to, you know, hear it from all sides. And uh, the guy was like, you know, hey, you sure you don't want to join the Marine Corps? Nah, I want to. I had these ambitions to do special ops type stuff. Yeah. And uh, we walked in the front door of his house to go look at all this kit that my dad wanted to buy. And uh, he had the, you know, completely not approved nowadays, I think with most of, most of us, but he had the uh, the love me wall. Like as soon as you walked in the living room. Sure. And it was just everything that you would see on the recruiting posters, you know, military free fall stuff, combat dive, the, the black kit, black roll kit, you know, all that stuff. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> nice. And uh, he's like, that's force recon. And I had no idea that the Marine Corps had uh, like that type of mission set. Yeah. And so he essentially, you got me hook, line and sinker right there. Yeah. And uh, I think the next week I went and signed up for like the delayed entry program. So that, uh, that started my trajectory towards the Marine Corps. And then uh, as I, you know, started realizing that I had to swim to, <laughs> to get in the Marine Corps, I started hitting the pool every day, um, which was a test in and out of itself. Um, the lifeguard actually helped me <laughs> learn how to swim. And uh, after about a month of her realizing I couldn't do a lap, she asked me what I was doing there. Told her the, the story. Uh, turns out her husband was a Navy recruiter. And so she's like, I'm going to help you out, dude, because you're nice. not so well in the water. <laughs> um, this guy saw that uh, I had some drive in me, and uh, he kind of set it up for me to join the Marine Corps, told me to be a communicator going in because that was the quickest way to get to force. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, 
kind of made some phone calls to some friends and uh, they were kind of expecting me to get into comm school and, and, uh, and get me orders and give me a shot. So I kind of got hooked up in that aspect. But uh, that's kind of how it all started was was Dude, that's through awesome. him. Yeah, that's funny because like for me and a lot like I always ask that question because I'm always curious about like what attracts different people from different places. And usually it's like I wanted to be a Marine and then I joined the Army or whatever. Like that was me. I, I Growing up, like Marines had the better recruitment, everything. And it was like, oh, you know, join the Marines. You're like the first guy that went the opposite way. It was like I was going to join the yeah. Army and then ended up in the Marines. Uh, it's pretty awesome that, uh, you know, knowing all the things you did later in your career that you had to learn how to swim to get in, right? It's like a lot of people, I think, one of the things I like about this show and when I was doing softcast is like a lot of people look at a dude who's a force recon Marine, then a Marsoc Raider, all these things, and like, oh, that guy must have grown up and he was just like captain of the football team, water polo, all these crazy things, and just ended up, and more often than not, it's like, no, nah, man, I was having the lifeguard teach me how to swim <laughs> so I could go get into this thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a cool story. So you end up joining. Mm -hmm. You get a chance. Like They're already kind of expecting you to go over there. What's that initial entry process like? Uh, not just the Paris Island thing, but to actually go over to force. So uh, there's typically a screening team that would go out to the units just to make sure you could swim and, and mm -hmm. had a, a first-class BFT. So when I went to 29 Palms for comm school, the... <laughs> Okay, so the the recon battalion, there's a, there's a distinction between recon and battalion and force at the time. They came out to do the screener. Okay. And uh, I took the screener, uh, I passed it, and they were like, hey, you know, you're ready to be a, a wolf and part of the wolf pack and giving me the whole deal. And uh, they were like, we're, we're going to cut you orders to recon battalion. And I uh, pretty much told him, I was like, Gunny, I can't do that. And he's like, what do you mean? Um, well... I'm supposed to go to force recon here. I am a PFC <laughs> telling a gunny I'm supposed to go to force. Uh, he threw, uh, a couple of, uh, explosives my way <laughs> and said, you're an idiot pretty much. So I, I run back to my barracks room and, uh, I called my buddy and I'm like, Hey man, I think I just fucked up. Like, uh, <laughs> he's like, no, you're good, man. I talked to him. They know you're in comm school right now. Okay. Fast forward a month, I take the screener again just to see if uh, if I would perform a little bit better. Uh, it, uh, comm school is a three month course yeah. out in 29 Palms. So I take it again, it's a different set of cadre from Recon, Recon Battalion. Same thing happens, you know, you're ready to run with the wolves type thing. And I told him, I said, Gunny, I can't, uh, I can't do that. I'm supposed to go to Force Recon. And they, same thing happens, you know, just different, different words. Sure. And uh, they call the staff and COIC in and they're like, what are you talking about, dude? I was like, well, I got this buddy, <laughs> you know, they got my name on the whiteboard and they said that I'm going to go to force. Dude, you don't have any orders. Like you don't cut orders until the end of the, the thing. So I, I deny recon battalion again. And uh, <laughs> we're getting about close to Christmas leave. And they come to my uh, my classroom, and they're like, "Hey, where's Smith at? What's your uh, what's your cami sizes? What's your boot sizes? Uh, and what's your gas mask size?" And I'm like, "Okay, call it off." And uh, they leave, and I'm like, "Whoa, why why just me?" <laughs> and they're like, "Well, you got over to first force, and you guys are going to OIF one, nice, uh, or going to uh, yeah. invade Iraq or whatever." So that was the start. Um, uh, I'll keep going just to yeah, yeah. Uh, understand how it works. But you typically take, when you go to force or any of the recon units at the time, you would take an NDOC, which is uh, about an eight hour physical event. Um, and that's your intro or introductory pathway to get uh, orders to the unit because they, you've shown that you have the, the physical capability to go on to the basic reconnaissance course. So I checked into first force uh, after Christmas leave as a support communicator. Mm -hmm. And then three weeks later, we were off to Kuwait uh, getting ready for the invasion. So I didn't do the in dock until I got back. Yeah. Spec Ops Tools has two missions, developing the highest performing hand tools available and supporting the men and women who serve our nation. They employ veterans, support veteran philanthropic events, and donate revenue from every sale to veteran service organizations that make a real impact. Go check out Spec Ops Tools today at specopstools.com. Prep for Impact is proudly brought to you by the Green Beret Foundation. The Green Beret Foundation takes a holistic approach to prioritize the well-being of Green Berets, their families, caregivers, and survivors. 
Green Beret Foundation's programs focus on nurturing the U.S. Army Special Forces community's mind, body, and spirit. Their five pillars of support work together to empower the Special Forces community to achieve their full potential in service to our country. Living lives of honor, dignity, and purpose. Visit GreenBeretFoundation.org for more information. But at that point, you were already uh, fully in docked through uh, a combat rotation, right? Well, yeah. more or less. Yeah, that was a tag along on that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just laugh my ass off thinking about like this. It's the equivalent of like some kid being in basic training, be like, "No, you don't understand. I'm going to group." Like, yeah, you and everybody else, man. Like, yeah. just uh, I, I you know, get back, through com school. <laughs> I, I look back and laugh at it because it's not the way things work, and uh, you know, hey, but it worked out for Red. Yeah, you know. All right, so how'd you feel going on that deployment? Like you said, you're tag along. You're a, you're a support communicator, but it's OIF one. Yeah. Like, uh, what do you remember from that rotation? I remember uh, getting over there and just being like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. The radios were different. Um, it was all HF. But and you've was, been in the Marine Corps for like four months or something, right? Uh, yeah. Like been in the Fleet Marine Force, yeah, for for three weeks. Yeah. But in the Marine Corps, a grand total of about seven months. Yeah. Um, and I'm just seeing all these guys, you know, with modified uniforms and yeah. spray paint on their guns and... Uh, uh, you know, I just, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Like I was just trying to learn, uh, drink through a fire hose and then, uh, learn my, learn my trade, learn how to uh, use the radios appropriately. And then really it all kind of rubber hit the road when we, when we did the push North, yeah. um, I was with the, the log train of about, I don't know, it was like yeah. 400 vehicles. miles and miles and miles. Yeah, yeah. So, so all the, all the generation kill stuff, I wasn't yeah. any part of that. I was, yeah. First time I ever wore nods was the, you know, the old halo thing, seven Bravos. And then yeah. I didn't realize until like we were already in Iraq, like I didn't have plates. <laughs> like I never, <laughs> I never picked up plates. So I was running around in an interceptor vest with like no plates in it. So, Hell yeah. um, I was just, it was, it was just something that I, I couldn't believe. I was, I don't know. <laughs> it was yeah. just weird. I think it would be just like completely unbelievable. Like how's it feel going over that berm? It's like, we all kind of remember our first move into combat but everybody's a little bit different right like that's a completely different experience than for me like going in and flying out to your fire base and like the war's already established at this point you just know like hey man we're driving into this other country and we're and i've have no experience at all much less in combat i don't even have experience other than boot camp and comm school that's pretty wild so like how did you as you go over the berm and then you ultimately was there a was there a place where like, okay, we're at a standstill here with the log train or how did that push work out? Yeah. The first push, uh, I think it was about 36 hours of driving. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the biggest thing was just trying not to have breaking contact because the, the unimproved roads, the dust, mm -hmm. you know, trying to learn how to, uh, piss out the side door while you're driving. Um, thinking to yourself, man, if we get shot at right now, I don't even know what to do. Yeah. Like, there was it's no, wild. There's no immediate action drills that were practiced. It was just, you know, get in and fit in and, and make it up there. And then, you know, when we when we made the first stop, it was really set the tent up, the the mobile uh, COC, and uh, set the, the the antennas out. So it was it was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I still look at it today. I'm like, holy crap! And like, just it was it was pretty wild. It's a great point though. It's like we think about it now. Like everybody gets to the end of their career or. You know, you've got some of the old gray beards that look at it now and they're like, oh, man, the current military, uh, you know, they kind of bemoan the readiness or whatever. And it's like, I don't know if you remember back in the day, but it, we weren't exactly like full of SOPs and, you know, reaction to contact as some of these things happened. And they were still successful because we had, uh, you know, enough bubbas and we had logistics and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just interesting as you come back from that trip. Right. How do you make the jump from, okay, hey, I've been, I've been a comms dude. Now I want to go on the other side. Yeah. So came back, did the, the leave, you know, post deployment leave. And then I got put in the training platoon, which is like another version of rip or, you know, like a roper rip would, uh, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. ranger. Rasp, guys no, do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I did that, um, getting ready for the end doc. And then, uh, you know, about a week prior to that, I injured my foot. So I had to, rolled to another rip class, uh, did that. And then I finally took the end doc and passed it like the, probably like the first week in November, uh, yeah. you know, that same year, 2003. And, uh, once the, uh, passed the end doc, uh, got orders to the basic reconnaissance course. It started up in January. Yeah. 
what do you remember from that course? Like, what's your, um, you know, you you probably different than some other cats in that course had at least seen mm-hmm. some of the unit in action. What do you remember about that course now coming in and trying to join their ranks? Yeah, uh, it definitely didn't help that I had been on deployment. I uh, In my young age, I thought that I was yeah. um, probably cooler than the other guys, even the instructors. Um, I remember that course being like one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Um, mostly to the fact that like after... I, I didn't understand how physical fitness and having your, your, how you have to train always. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's not like a bank account. You don't save money and it stays it in there. It just stays there. <laughs> so like I passed the indoc and just kind of, you know, fucked off all through November yeah. and then Christmas leave. And then I showed up in January to take the end, the end test. And you're what, like 19 or so at that point? I just point? turned yeah. 20. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so like when I did my initial end test for BRC, I was like, oh shit, <laughs> uh, I am not prepared yeah. physically and so there is no, you know, recovery time while you're there. It's, yeah. it is nonstop for three months straight. So it was, it was difficult. And, uh, <laughs> I learned a valuable lesson. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a tough, a tough school. Um, and, uh, barely made it out the other side. I'll say I was, I was in that lower 10% for sure. Yeah. You ultimately end up, uh, you know, passing, you end up, uh, going to force you deployed, couple times before it switched over to MARSOC, mm-hmm. right? What do you remember from those deployments? Obviously, you'd been uh, OAIF-1 in a different capacity. Now you're out there doing the deed. What do you remember about those deployments? Yeah, they were, you know, Force Recon, Recon Battalion is, is pretty cut and dry. It's it's reconnaissance and raids. Mm-hmm. And it's really the, 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 um, the sole focus of those organizations. So, um, you know, we were pretty responsible for supporting the RCT out in the AMBAR. Okay. Um, so I think I may have done maybe three or four recce's during that time and a lot of the counter ID stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was just raids, not the same tempo that you probably experienced or some of the other organizations. Uh, it was, you know, a couple times a week versus mm-hmm. the every night type of deal. Yeah. But, um, I, <laughs> I don't like to take it lightly, but as I look back on it, I'm kind of like, it was kind of like the best CQB training you could ever do. Like it was the best rut. Um, I don't think like, I know I didn't shoot a shot in anger the whole time. Um, there wasn't a lot of contact. Yeah. Um, we smacked a lot of targets, mm, pretty crappy Intel on a lot of them. Yeah. And I think like the, the second one I did was we were getting some like hand me down targets that were kind of okay, but mm-hmm. it was, it was just, uh, uh, you know, a, a decent amount of raids, but not a lot of like activity really. That's not, yeah. not everyone. Like there were some platoons that yeah, went yeah, out sure. and, and whooped it on, but not, not in my experience. That was my first deployment, man. It was like, uh, kind of the same thing. It was like, we were out in a place where we were going out three times a week or whatever. And we would go and sometimes it would be to hit a target that sometimes didn't have great Intel. Sometimes it'd be doing a med cap or whatever. And, uh, I felt the same way. It was like the best training uh, cause you knew every time you went out, like it, it could get real right. and you had to be wired tight, but it was a soft entry for sure. And it wasn't, you know, I know I got buddies that their first rotation a month into it, you know, we lost, uh, not on my team, but on a, on a adjacent team and it was their first, uh, you know, trip as well. And they lost two or three guys in the first month. Right. And so it was like complete and they were in the same province, right. There's just mm-hmm. like a couple of, uh, you know, they're 45 minute helo right away or whatever. And it was a hundred percent different. Right. So it's just, you never know rotation to rotation and even fighting season to fighting season in that same place. You know, uh, I had Jay Collins on the show, uh, on like episode two, and he was in that same fire base that I'm talking about. But a year later, there was like a third group team in between us. And that was where he got shot multiple times. <laughs> like, right. it's just, you never know, uh, you know, kind of roll of the dice when you get into each one of them. This episode is brought to you by the Green Beret Foundation's Next Ridgeline Program. The Green Beret Foundation's Next Ridgeline Transition Support Program ensures that Special Forces soldiers and their families are prepared for all of life's transitions. Transitioning from active duty service to civilian life is one that all soldiers will go through, and this program provides a trusted resource for navigating the VA disability claims process. The GBF is the only soft nonprofit accredited by the US VA to prepare, file, and appeal VA disability claims and benefits. For more information, visit GreenBeretFoundation.org slash transition support. Most tool companies try to be everything to everyone, but the result is just okay. 
That is why Spec Ops Tools focuses on two main goals, designing and building the best hand tools available and supporting veterans in every capacity they can. You can have the most elite hand tools while doing good for veterans nationwide with Spec Ops Tools. Check them out today at specopstools.com. So as you start hearing about Marsoc, mm-hmm. right? How long, like, at what, are you a gunny at that point? Like, where are you at in your career when you start hearing this thing of like, force might bifurcate, we might mm-hmm. make this new special operations Marsoc thing. How does that first start coming out? So that, the original, you know, inception of that was heard about when I went to OIF one. So really, okay. I had no idea. It was yeah, that so early. Yeah. The decision uh, to be made to, to have Marsoc exist, you started, you know, early mm-hmm. on in the war. And I think they, they solidified that decision around 2002 and mm-hmm. it was more of a, a Rumsfeld like forcing function. I don't think wow. SOCOM, yeah. you know, I, I'm not a historian with right. that whole thing, but I, I think that there was a forcing function put on SOCOM and uh, Marsoc was going to create what's called debt one, which was like mm-hmm. a test bed for the pre, it was the precursor for Marsoc. So mm-hmm. when that happened, um, they created a hundred man debt that had a 30 man platoon in it. And they cherry picked some of the, you know, high performing individuals throughout the reconnaissance community. Yeah. Um, a few of those cats deployed to OIF one because the unit hadn't been formed up yet. So there was like this six man group that had their own <laughs> little tent and, um, they were already, you know, guys were, piecemealing into that organization so yeah. we already knew it was going to exist and then when we got back that's when you started hearing about debt one because they were starting to do their their work up for their deployment mm, okay and so they actually went out on their first trip and came back and aar'd with us when i was going out on my first platoon rotation in 2005 so they had mm. joined up and you know talked about no two they had already deployed i think by late oh four mm. something like that yeah, it sounds about right. Oh four ish. I never knew it was that early. Oh, like I had J Root and others that I was talking about, and for some reason I had it in like the oh eight, oh nine time frame in my mind for some reason. Um, you know, just was like that's my memory of I guess when I heard about it, you right. know, but it was already been going on for quite some time. What makes you you know, talk to me about your sort of as you're hearing about that, you're in force, how do you start saying like, Okay, I wanna go in that direction? Was it your choice? Were you part of like I know the answer, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. So once those guys, you know, rolled out and uh, came back, they were essentially going back into their next workup. I pumped out with my uh, my force rotations, and it was the the last platoon that I was in in force. It was probably a month out. Everybody's in the room, and then hey, you know, Johnson, Jones, Smith, blah 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 you guys are going to Marsoc. Yeah. The rest of the room, you're going back to recon battalion, which, which was actually really smart. I know some of those, there's a lot of animosity right there because, mm-hmm. you know, we were all same background, but they didn't want to, they didn't want to take all of the senior experience out of the force community. Yeah. They wanted to make sure that they held some of that back at recon battalion. So yeah, I, I found out probably a month before we got home in 06 and then went to a couple schools and then when i came back from schools all the flags and the you know the placards and everything had changed and we were first marine special operations battalion at yeah. that time so that's kind of how that happened it was just a luck of the draw type thing no nah, like you said man it makes sense like you can't you can't just decapitate the experience off of an existing unit and start something else and expect like you have to you know kind of push it a little bit but what do you remember like what's your What's your thought process on that formation? Um, you know, how did you experience as a dude who was getting kind of voluntold to go over there? Um, ultimately, you spent a ton of time there, mm-hmm. and obviously, that's like your, you know, uh, your group. Um, but how did that kind of transition work? Because I know, like you said, there's some animosity. There was a lot of like back and forth from SOCOM and other tribes of like, mm-hmm. hey. You know what are these guys doing when you know where's the rotation we ultimately end up working together quite a bit group you know group dudes and marsoc dudes quite a bit because we had similar mission sets in afghanistan and iraq so yeah 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 so when when the decision was made it all kind of set in right right in place like the first couple months it was like mm-hmm. you know we're gonna send you this gucci school you know like stuff that we never heard of before um but it was also it was like 
about damn time type of feeling because <laughs> you got to remember we, we've been we've been busting around in the OIF space around yeah. you guys, uh, you know, the SEALs and, and everyone else. And we're seeing, well, how come this Blackhawk or 47 is coming back every morning at 4 a.m. when I'm on my run with feet hanging off the side of it? Like, we're not working that hard. Like, we're, yeah. you know, and then you see them come back and then leave again. And you're like, holy shit, these guys are they're putting it on and, and we knew that there was a, a a difference between being a part of socom but in our minds you know we had the same level of sure. caliber yeah. of guys just because we go to the same schools we do all yeah. those things so that that was part of it and then you start seeing like oh wow we got more kit like yeah. nicer stuff um and all of those things and the training um started getting a little bit more specialized and things like that so originally when we stood up the we assumed that we were going to perform the same functions that the force platoons were 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 um ca carrying out priorly so that we for we formed our organization based off of that so we had what was called the daster platoon mm -hmm. and it was two recce teams six man recce teams and like f i think like four or six assault teams and then we had a trailer platoon of infantry uh just like the model that we had with the MSPF mm -hmm. and they were kind of like that Ranger role, like the, the yeah, traditional yeah. type Ranger for everybody thinks about where they were like the outer cordon, mm -hmm. you know, supporting fires for us. So we built that, th that way. And that's the way we trained. It was recce special reconnaissance and, and raids. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was kind of the, the model that we thought we were going to go forward and, and execute. And that's how it happened. It was just, we just beefed up force, mm -hmm. uh, first and second force, um, under SOCOM dollars now and training. And then there was a third battalion called, uh, the, the FMTU, the foreign military training unit, which was, it was essentially infantry guys that were, they were holding the fort down on all the JSET missions. So mm -hmm. for a, the short, uh, beginning of MARSOC first and second were straight Afghanistan. And those guys were doing all the J sets at the time until we, we started uh, mixing that up a little bit. So Yeah, from from the outside, what I remember from some of that, and again, I don't know why I thought it was 08, 09, because this was 06, 07, I think, was when I started really hearing about it, was, uh, you know, when I got to group or when I was in the Q course, like, I thought Force Recon was part of SOCOM, mm -hmm. right? This is like, oh, yeah, that's their SOF, right? And then it was like, no, they're not part of SOCOM because the Marine Corps kind of like, hey, we – all of our guys are special or whatever, and we don't want to have anybody that's like set apart, even though force was that way. But anyway, yeah. uh, and then I remember like, okay, hey, these guys, now it's formed, but it was like, there was like a gray area for a while of like, is it in SOCOM, is it not? Um, and then ultimately you guys, you started that way, but you started to kind of evolve into, okay, we're going to do foreign internal defense, all this other stuff. I know there was some animosity from the SF side because it's like, they're taking our jobs kind of thing, but we were also kind of, looking other way, places and not doing some of our traditional jobs. So mm -hmm. there was some white space there that needed to be filled by uh, not just not just Marsoc, but several other units that were like, okay, if you're not going to do it, we'll do it kind of thing. So, um, but as you start deploying, right, you start going with Marsoc, um, you know, you got platoons of raiders and all these things. What do you remember kind of the difference comparing and contrasting those deployments? Obviously, it's a different part in the war, but back to your force deployments, like, mm -hmm similarities differences what do you remember between those when when we first got out there so when we originally formed the marine corps uh was under the assumption that we were going to be on the marine expeditionary units we were still gonna, yeah. we we're still going to be on the boats and because when the when the mu goes out they have what's called special operations capable mm -hmm. they have that they have a special operations like capability that exists on the mu so we had to ride the boats out for the first couple of uh iterations um but when we got into Afghanistan and we started uh, working, they, they partnered us up with a, a third group team. And I was down in Goresh mm -hmm. and we were, you know, Helmand province was kind of our, our area of operations at the time. What year was this? This was 07. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, when we, when we got out there, I was like, man, this isn't, this is nothing special about yeah. this. Like, we've got some pretty rad, you know, scary trucks and a lot of dudes, but it was like being a, a really well-trained, equipped, like cat platoon from the infantry. So I was like this, I would rather be doing what I was doing back at force. Um, now granted it was fun, like yeah, don't get me sure. wrong, but yeah. it was not, it didn't appear special to me at that time. And all this cool Gucci training that we did, we weren't performing any of those yeah. in theater. So 
it wasn't until follow on, like it started morphing to what it is. And I was like, okay, this is, this makes sense now. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I did, we felt kind of the same way sometimes yeah. too. It's like you're out in the middle of nowhere. You're like in a fire base where you essentially like later in the war was similar to some of the infantry cops that were just out in the middle of you know, nowhere kind of holding ground in these valleys and kind of terrain denial. And yeah, we, we've got indige with us and we're going out and doing missions and all this stuff, but it definitely wasn't like if I had to write out what I thought it was going to be. Now I got to do some deployments later that were more, uh, you know, task force kinetic, like going out every night and all that stuff. And that's just what I thought we were going to do all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's such a variance in soft missions across both of our tribes, depending on where you're at, at what time in the war, uh, you know, everything from working solely with indige to working completely unilaterally, it just is kind of luck of the draw, depending on, uh, you know, kind of what time frame it is. So you start kind of getting up in leadership, right? Mm -hmm. What do you remember as your, you know, you're kind of defining like maturation as you start having leadership positions? How do you remember that? Because like for us, you know, becoming a senior is a big deal, but really like becoming a team sergeant and being in charge of a 12 person team is like kind of our pinnacle role. Like what's y'all's kind of, is it platoon chief? What's your kind of, uh, and, and how did you feel kind of moving into those, into those spots? Yeah. So after that trip, we, when we took the role that we had now where we created MSOTs, which mm -hmm. are essentially ODAs. Mm -hmm. Um, but like full disclosure, I never took on a leadership position. Yeah. I, I maintained my communication MOS while having the secondary 0321 because mm -hmm. we didn't get the MARSOC MOS until like 2012. Yeah. And so I was just, the the senior 18 echo essentially sure. for the yeah. team and then um the team chief positions were 0372 guys yeah, so you guys do it differently on a couple of yeah. different ways like you guys do it differently with leadership mm -hmm. on like gunnies versus like i didn't know any of that stuff until i got to yeah. socom and i was like oh, okay this guy's a star major and i like started talking to him about like team guy stuff and he's like yeah i don't know that's not me you oh, know he's yeah, like an admin admin sergeant major i'm like oh hey i didn't know you guys had yeah. that like yeah, we, we don't have that <laughs> dude I, it baffles me to this day like it's a weird setup like hey dude yeah. um you're an infantry guy and then you decide to go first sergeant and they're like yeah. we're gonna send you to the air wing yeah and so like having having a non-critical skill operator yeah. first sergeant sergeant majors that's like it's just weird because what what do you it's weird for them too i'm yeah. sure you know what i mean yeah. like if you took me and dropped me in some aviation battalion and you're like all right man hey you're the senior listener they're like all right cool what do yeah. we do like what's going on here yeah uh, it's kind of, <laughs> exactly. kind of a weird thing i mean i don't know like i said i, I had no idea because you know there's not a whole lot of like there was interplay between us and Marsop, but i wasn't like hey teach me how the marine corps works it's like all right hey, let's go on this target or whatever right <laughs> <laughs> um so you start you start moving up a little bit you ultimately end up going to Special Operations Command, uh, the SOCOM headquarters, and that's where we end up working together, going on uh, you know some of the parachute team things and stuff like that. Um, talk me through kind of that transition in your career, like what what preceded that, what made you jump up here, and uh, you know what do you remember from those times? Yeah, so uh, I was reaching the tail end of my eleven. I was on a, a trip in eleven. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the call came down that I was going to go to the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. um, so I moved out to Lejeune, did some schoolhouse time. And uh, as I was creeping up towards the tail end of that, yeah. uh, a prior teammate of mine asked me to join a group of guys to kind of put feelers out in the soft enterprise on sort of the missions that, that are far left to bang. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, to, to see, you know, the war obviously was dying down with regards to our involvement with uh, Afghanistan. And there's a lot of other things that soft does. So I got pulled into that for a little while, did a trip with them. And then phone call came up. Hey dude, there's a position down in Tampa. We want you to, to take, um, are you, are you willing to do it? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Like, so yeah. got, got a uh, shot down to the SOCOM and then, uh, that kind of, you know, like opened my eyes to a new thing and it was able to like kind of get back, information back to Mars like, like look hey, we might want to start thinking about mm -hmm. you know moving forces to do this type of work or, or move to this location or use these guys as mission partners for things like that so yeah it's interesting <laughs> uh, before we get there when you were doing that schoolhouse time right you came back as an instructor to a course that you didn't really go through right yeah. so like yeah how did that work out it's like uh, 
for us, like our Q course has been established. Yeah, we change it all the time and whatever. But like that was a newer thing than you had kind of gotten grandfathered through the force mm -hmm. route and gone through some of the schools, but not that exact thing. How did you feel coming back to that and like obviously bringing a ton of experience and combat relevance back and saying like, you know, hey, let me pass this on. But how did you feel about that instructor time? First of all, like the instructor time was by far one of the most rewarding mm -hmm. uh, things that I went to kicking and screaming. Like yeah. I wanted nothing to, and I'm, you know the deal. <laughs> Every guy does. Swick, yeah. Swick, same yeah. Thing. yeah. Um, yeah, so that was definitely at the forefront, but the majority of the instructor cadre as well had not been to um, the the ITC course. Mm -hmm. And so, but what we did have was a, a, a cadre, um, a collective cadre core that were very, uh, very passionate about these guys because guys yeah. were still going to open it on. Yeah. Um, we knew that these guys were going to go jump right into a team, but um, it definitely... It, being an instructor is probably one of the few times where you realize how much you don't know. Like if you can't, yeah. if you can't teach things, you know, you're like, hold on, man. Like I'm not, I'm not conveying this message to these guys the right way or yeah. they're not getting it. And also I now I have to be an example for everything. Like these, like if a, if a group of guys in my team know me and they know that I like to clown around, like that's fine, yeah. but you can't do that in front of these dudes. Yeah. And, so it was a it was a phenomenal time. It was definitely I probably worked harder as an instructor than I did um, in the teams. Uh, but it was the most eye opening thing for me was I spent a, a couple months in the selection branch and got to see what it is that we are assessing and selecting for. Yeah, and that really just like it's like okay, it all makes sense now yeah. because the recon bubbas it's it's a very much shut up color, keep your head down, put one foot in front of the other yeah. and just deal with the suck. And when you go into a selection like ours, which is, is very yeah. uh, similar to yours, it's they're evaluating for character traits and the, yeah. and the character traits that you have have to exist without being yelled at because you're not getting yelled at. You have to do these things and you don't know how you're doing. It's easy to tell if you're falling out of a run and a cadre is screaming at the top of his lungs at sure. you, you know, but, um, when when I saw how they they try to uh, employ like non bias uh, data yeah. collection because everyone is a everyone's a good dude you know you're mm -hmm. a good dude you're good yeah. but the data doesn't lie and the way that they did that was a, a very big eye opening thing and uh, and I'm glad that they send uh, MSOTs there after their rotations to go support the selection mm -hmm. and be a part of that cadre. Um, um, members that go out and, and run the selection program so yes yeah, that's interesting like you said like our our selection is the same way like there's no there's no correction given right mm -hmm. like during selection i was just talking to a kid uh actually somebody reached out because of this or i think it's because of the meme page or whatever and uh i was telling him i was like hey man you just gotta like they're not gonna tell you what to do they're gonna they're gonna teach you how to do land nav and whatever because that's like part of the thing is to see how you imprint new information but like they're not going to tell you, Hey, on the next one, do this. Like, like you said, you got, it's already got to exist. Right? right. And so without giving any of that stuff away, like, what do you remember attribute wise of like things that, you know, you said you were, you were excited to see that it was, it was based around character traits. Like, what do you remember being impactful of like, you know, without giving away like, Oh, we measure this, but like for us, I know we've got kind of core attributes. And one of the things yeah. I've always wanted to do, uh, is like go to SWIC and there's like the old file cabinets and i would love to pull out like you know 19 year old matt's selection thing and be like holy cow because i know it has to be completely different than what i remember right because at the time when you're going through it you're just everything's coming at you at a million miles an hour and so it's always cool to me to kind of hear like hey we're selecting for these types of attributes we can train for skill but these are the kind of the core things that we're looking for do you remember anything like off the top of your head of like this is this is really foundational. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's, it's things like uh, effective intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, teamwork, you know, uh, integrity, like all these things. Yeah. It, it's kind of funny because there's like I think there's an epidemic, social media world, YouTube yeah. world, where like it, everybody wants to know what's the secret to going through these things, and the reality is that anyone can get in shape. Yeah, there's a lot of like straight physical specimens, but if you don't have these core s traits. All they're doing is they're using these physical events, you know, sleep deprivation, mm -hmm. uh, hunger. They're using those things to expose who you truly are as a man. And so if you don't have the ability to 
get yourself out of bed in the morning or accomplish your homework on time or, you know, do the right thing when, when no one's looking and be, you know, the best human being you can be, then you're not going to be able to do that regardless of how well you're in shape when everything is stacked up against you and you're tired and you haven't slept mm -hmm. in a couple of days. And so I, I just think like, yeah, there's a bunch of character traits. I think it's like 12 of them and I, don't, mm -hmm. I can't yeah, decide them right now. But like, I think number one, it, the number one trait to have is, is humility. Yeah. Understanding that no matter how well you do, there's always something to improve on, you know, being able to take constructive criticism and, and just realize that uh, that's what the, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, it, no, it's a great point. One of the reasons I asked the question is like what sparked as, I, as you were talking about that is exactly what you said. Like we're, we're using stress to expose your core attributes and your core competencies, right? But the problem we have sometimes is we now, like if we go through the entire Q course and it's always about not having food and not having sleep and all that, like all of that is just a substitute to try to induce stress. There's only a few ways to induce stress without actually shooting at somebody and having them feel like they're gonna die. You take away food, take away sleep, you put them on a tight timeline. Like there's only a few ways that you can get that same sort of reaction that's gonna either make you bind together as a team or make you go at each other, right? Well, what I noticed as a team sergeant later was like, we were setting ourselves up that way and like every one of our rotations, every training thing, we were setting ourselves up to never sleep and whatever. And then it started like going into combat where guys are like, yeah, well, we'll just, we'll just go out and like, and like, no dude, like we use that in training to induce stress. We don't have to plan to be stressed while we're in combat. Like, let's go out with our best foot forward. And I started noticing it and I realized like, it's because in the Q course, like no one sat you down is like, hey, this is why we're doing it this way. And so some people I noticed hadn't made that jump and like realized that. And so they just thought like, hey, that's the SF way. And it's like, no, man, like we do that in training so that we can get that stress and work through it. And so it was like, you had to reframe it for people sometimes. Cause like you'd ask a guy to run training and he'd give you a training schedule. It's like, bro, Matt, we, we don't have to do I'm it that way. I'm calling bullshit on that, dude. Really? Okay. I I found out what GVNT is. <laughs> so I know I know you guys. Hey, know you how found to sleep. out about it because you opened the Marsoc manual with SF scribbled across the top of it. GVNT, dude. Scratched out and you guys probably changed it to Marsoc NT or something. Got yeah. your uh, got yeah, your nap times. The, hey, the Green Beret nap times are critical. They are. To uh, everything we have on a team. Uh no, I mean, it's it's just funny because it's uh, you know, we want to induce stress and then we plan for stress sometimes. I was like, "All right, man." Like let's pump the brakes. Like we can we can go into this rotation like fully ready to go, right? Um, so when you think about those attributes, having a long career in both force and in more shock, if I ask you like who's the best dude you ever worked with on a team, whoever pops in your mind, what why is it that they pop in your mind? Like what of those attributes and their ability to be a good teammate and be a good warrior or whatever it is. What can we take from that person so that we can be better people? Um, and you don't have to say their name. You yeah, can if you want to. It's up to you. No. Uh, I mean, it's kind of an easy one in my brain. With leaving names aside, there's a few yeah. of them that come to sure. mind e equally for different reasons. But um, extremely proficient at their job, obviously. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of guys that are proficient at their job. But they were uh, guys that put friendship aside when it's, you know, I, one of the, one of my biggest mentors, uh, we would shoot the shit. Um, but if I did something wrong on an op, yeah, it, it's gotta, it's gotta be voice. It's gotta be told, you know, and, and no yeah, special treatment. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, so, um, it's the guys that held people accountable through, uh, their own actions and they demanded high performance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, I got a, a, quite a few guys in my brain wrapped around that. So, um, luckily, luckily for me, you know, I was able to have guys like that on every single trip. That yeah, you know, you want to emulate. It's hard. It's hard to emulate them because they're just better than you. Yeah. You know, but, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. This episode is brought to you by the 1952 Society. Your support is crucial to the Green Beret Foundation's efforts to improve the U.S. Army Special Forces community. In joining the 1952 Society, you are directly impacting Green Berets, their families, survivors, and caregivers with supplemented support not covered by the U.S. DOD or the Department of the VA. Through a monthly recurring donation, you can help the Foundation meet the increasing needs of the regiment. Take the first step and join the 1952 Society today at greenberetfoundation.org society. 
This episode is brought to you by Andy's Fund. The Master Sergeant Andrew Marcasano Suicide Prevention Fund supports the mental health care needs of Green Berets and their families not covered by military health care. GBF takes a holistic perspective, considering treatments and therapies that may address underlying concerns such as substance abuse, PTS, TBI, chronic pain, and more, which can contribute to suicidal ideation. The Green Beret Foundation aims to ensure every Green Beret and their family receives the necessary treatment and care, leaving no one behind. To learn more, visit greenberetfoundation.org slash andysfund. I haven't really heard that one before, and it makes total sense. Like, I, I identify that with that throughout my career as well. It's like, you know, you're boys with somebody, but when it's when they're in a leadership position or when you mess – even if they're not in a leadership position, they're peer to you, and something gets messed up, like, hey, man, I'm not going to treat you differently – then I'm going to treat this other guy just because we're friends. Like overall, the mission is the most important thing. So that's, that's awesome. So, you know, I want to get to some fun stuff because you and I had the same experience of being able to be at the SOCOM headquarters and join this parachute team. And all of a sudden like start going out. And like, I think you were kind of similar because we talked about this before. Like I didn't have anything on social media. I never, like we didn't wear uniforms around or anything. And then suddenly I'm on like the 50 yard line. You and I are in the big house in Michigan and we're in like, SOCOM colors and people are coming up and it was weird. Right. And yeah. we had to, I had to like learn, like, what do I say when somebody comes up? It's like, thank you for my, thank you for your service or whatever. Like talk to me about your time in the parachute team. Cause you were phenomenal. I will say this uh, on camera because people are like, Oh Matt, you're such a great narrator or whatever. You're the reason I was a great narrator. I saw you do it for the first time in Michigan and <laughs> my head exploded. Cause you were just like peacocking around that joint and you were hilarious. <laughs> and I was like, I want to do that. Like red is phenomenal on that. And the only reason I really got to do it is because you got your pro license and started actually jumping into Alabama and all these places. So I had such a blast um, being on that team period, but being on that team with you, mm-hmm. every time you were on a trip and I was on a trip, I was like, hell yeah, red's going to be there. We're going to have a good time. Yeah. Right. Whether I was getting in an Uber wreck in Michigan or what it was. So talk to me about how you felt from your experience of coming in there and being on that team. Yeah. Um, you know, it's an opportunity of a lifetime check into SOCOM. Hey, you should try out for this parachute team. Yeah. Uh, in like people have to remember too, that it's a part-time job. Yeah. It's not a real job. Um, yeah. You know, you do your full, <laughs> your full time and then you're, you're dedicating yeah. weekends, uh, to go out there and train and, uh, and, and then go all around the country to perform. Right. So, yeah. um, the road to becoming a demonstrator is obviously its own challenge because mm-hmm. the, the difference between military free fall and 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 jumping into a football stadium is is two totally separate animals. Yeah. But um, it was a it was what I needed at the time because and you know the deal. Guys go to this four star command. You just left a highly kinetic um you know time in your life and you're you're in the team, bro. I was gonna say tight knit community. Yeah, and, yeah. and then you go and you're working around. You know, enlisted guys are few and yeah. far between there. Like, especially enlisted, soft, actual, right? Like, yeah. So, tab bear, badge wearing, so soft dudes. Yeah. To have a team of guys that are collectively working on something and something that's very difficult. Yeah. Um, in in a, a high stress environment that has significant repercussions for the command if something goes wrong, was the type of thing I needed to keep me focused on something. Yeah, me too. Um, coming out of that uh, that environment. And so everything like engagements, just yeah. uh, talking to people and, and shaking hands. I mean, you are rep- uh, SOCOM as a yeah. whole doesn't have a big, uh, you know, PR element that does yeah. things. So you're kind of the face of all these people. Um, so that was it's a lot of stress, right? You're yeah. standing in a group of people. They're asking you questions. You're shaking hands and you're just trying to make sure that you're delivering the message that the four star wants delivered every time you go out. And then you start talking about narrating in front of a hundred thousand people <laughs> and delivering SOCOM's message and showing uh, the American people a small piece of the type of capability that exists. And you know, you mentioned that that big house game, but like, yeah. I was almost puking in the. I know you were. That was hilarious. That was one of the yeah. scariest things I've ever done. But yeah. You just kind of like got to hype yourself up. And He's like Matt. Dude, I'm going to throw up. Man. I'm going to throw up. And I'm like, really? Because I was like new on the team and you had done this before. And I was my first time in the big house too. And I'm the drop zone safety officer on the ground, like setting everything up. And it's just you and I. And you're like, bro, I'm freaking out, man. And I'm like, yeah. oh no. Because I certainly wasn't going to narrate at that point. And you completely just freaking sucked it up and went out and crushed it. And I just remember being like, this is one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of. Uh, what was your favorite demo when you think about it? Man, uh, Okay. 
Mo- most biggest demo was definitely Alabama yeah. LSU in 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the best performance. At Alabama, biggest game of the year, yeah. crazy Joe Burrow year. Yeah, you def- awesome. It, but it's never a good demo when you walk off the football field with logo paint all over your pants because you, you know. You did hit the logo. Yeah, I hit the logo. With parts, so. of, you know, other parts. But, man, I remember narrating that game, and they were just deafening. Like, yeah. Just awesome. Yeah, it, definitely one of the most intense experiences uh, I think I've ever had was, was jumping into that game. Yeah, it's crazy when, like, for me on the ground, I get them, like, get them rocking, right? And then you guys come in. And like it almost takes my breath away every single time, just because it's it's freaking cool, man. And it's like it's the flag, it's America, it's all these things. And then like watching the helmet cam afterwards, and like hearing the crowd from like two thousand or twenty five hundred feet, and you can start hearing just the oh yeah of the stadium is just there's nothing like it. Like that adrenaline of a college football game day. Like we did a ton of other things. But, man, those college football game days are just something else, man. This is like that energy is one of the coolest things. Like, I, I miss it so much now that I'm retired. Like, uh, now that college football season is yeah. starting, I'm like, yeah. oh, man, I miss. Like, it's cool to be on the field for NFL games and some of those other things. And there's big – but, man, some about – It's just different, Dude, man. college football. Especially SEC. Dude, 100,000 people. <laughs> it's just nuts, man. It's so, so fun. But then, like you said, man, it really struck me, like, representing – the command and ultimately like representing the, how, how often do you get to put on a flag and represent the country? It's like almost like Olympic type of thing, right? Like when the Olympians go out and they're like once every four years, I was doing this business school thing with like a bunch of the former Olympians. And I was like talking to them about it and they're like, yeah, man, it's kind of crazy. Like you've been doing the luge or whatever for your whole life. And then all of a sudden you've got this USA track suit on and everybody looks at you like completely differently. And that's how I felt when we would go to some of these places, like we'd walk through LSU or Michigan or Ole Miss or one of these places, and it's like, you represent SOCOM, you represent the nation, you represent DOD. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of pressure to hit the logo or to say the right thing on the mic or to say the right thing to mom and pop who come up to you and are just so excited. And they got their kid, you know, and they're like, hey, this guy's a whatever, you know, and you're like, ah, hey, how's it going, man? (laughs) But I, I agree with you, man. It was exactly what I needed to. It was like get some of that team room vibe, get a shared thing where we were going out and like trying to do something really hard. Uh, it was awesome. I, uh, you know, I only got time for one more question as I look at the big clock over there. Um, you look at now retired Red Smith with a ton of experience. <coughs> Excuse me. As you look back at like whether it's force, whether it's the guy, the kid in comm school whether it's the guy at the beginning of Marsoc, what if you could go back and talk to that guy for 10 minutes, what what advice would you give him knowing what you know now? Uh, I would just say enjoy it. Yeah. You know, uh, don't take any moment for granted. Um, and, uh, you know, give it every bit of effort you have. And, and actually, you know, I think the most important thing I would I would – go back and I, and I wouldn't change anything right that's a bad way to live your life is yeah, to, yeah. to go back and say like gosh you've done this better but i would just say focus more on your circle mm. um i think the marine corps is really good at it in yeah. a way but negative is you know we, we have these things of like changing the organization and 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 all of this but sometimes you just need to be good at at uh affecting your circle positively whether it's your family and your teammates your friends yeah. instead of you know, focusing too, too high uh, ahead of that, uh, yeah. trust the process, allow it to happen organically and, and dedicate your time and effort to the people that are close to you. I think that's the one thing that I would, I would focus on. No, I love it. I, I talk to people about that a little bit because people are like, Oh, well, I'm not in a leadership position. Like, yeah, you are like, <laughs> you have a leadership role in your sphere of influence. 100% mm-hmm. the peers you have, there's somebody looking at you, even if you're the lowest guy in if you're doing the right thing, you're going to positively influence that circle. And if you're doing the wrong thing, you can definitely negatively influence it. Man, I appreciate you coming in. I've always had a, uh, a blast with you. I'm going to try to attempt to tell my favorite Red Smith story super fast because I'm running out of time. But we're in Michigan, right? I think it was that same game, right? Or was that the year after? It might have been the year after. No, it was Michigan-Notre Dame. Yeah. That's the one that got rained out. Yeah, that's the one that, that's right. So we go out. 
everybody else, the old dudes leave. Red's like, come on, man, let's go have one more beer, right? We go to this place, we go to this sports bar. We're not feeling it. We have like one beer and we leave. Like, honest, I'm not joking, right? We leave, we've each had like two beers. We hop in this Uber, we're going back to the hotel. We're sitting at a stop sign and all of a sudden a dude rear ends us in this Uber, right? And Red and I, like I've had a bunch of neck surgeries. He's been banged up a lot. We get out and we're like, oh man, like that, that hurt a little bit. We look over and we're in the front yard basically of like this flop house, college house. And these kids are out playing beer pong on the front porch. And they look over and they're like, holy cow, you guys just got in a wreck. And we're like, yeah, man. They're like, you okay? We're like, yeah. They're like, you want a beer? And I look at Red and I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So we ended up playing beer pong with these college kids out on their front porch. And I'll never forget, we went in their house and this was like a shared house. There's like six of these little kids living there. And they had just like in their kitchen, they had like a thousand little, you know, everybody brings their toaster or whatever. They had like 10 toasters in there, all this different stuff. And they had this rice cooker. And there was this Asian kid that was in there with us. And I remember you looked at him and you're like, is that you right there? And he looks over and he's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. And we just bust out laughing. So we ended up, we ended up having the Uber driver play with us. We tried to get the cops to play with us. So the funniest part of the story is afterwards, the next day we're going in, we're doing all our stuff. And there's like a promo video that got put out on social media. And one of those kids, moms like comments on it. It's like, these guys are the nicest guys ever. They celebrated my son's birthday with him, all these things. I have never once uh, in my life, there's like a thousand of those stories and it's always a good time with red. Uh, I miss you, buddy. I wish we were still on the parachute team running around. Uh, but I appreciate you coming in, man. It's been Thanks, a blast. Man. Appreciate it. It's cool to hear uh, your kind of experience coming up through the Marine Corps. Because all I know is like, you know, we worked together later in career. And it's like, yeah, yeah okay. He was, he was a force dude and he was a MARSOC dude. There's not, uh, there's not like that much time to sit around and be like, hey, walk me through your career, Red. Let's, let's yeah. talk about it, right? Uh, I will say, I don't know if you want to plug, but uh, you should definitely go follow Red on Instagram. We'll have his link if he lets us uh, underneath the show notes. Uh, but I'm excited to see some of your boys, uh, some of the Marsoc dudes, because I know you have, uh, you're very highly respected in the community. Every time I meet a Marsoc dude, if your name comes up, there's always a smile on their face. And that's like, to me, the best uh, that's the best feedback from a guy's career that I know. So, uh, I hope all you guys out there, everybody that's listening, I hope you enjoyed this pr uh, episode of prep for impact as much as I did. Uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, subscribe, rate it, hit the little bell, whatever it is, uh, help us out over there and wherever you're listening to it. If you're listening to it on audio, uh, Spotify, uh, Apple podcasts, whatever it is, uh, do us a favor, rate the show, subscribe, send it to somebody and, uh, check out both prep for impact on Instagram and uh, Facebook and Twitter and all that mess, but also check out some of the ads that you heard during this for Green Beret Foundation and for Spec Ops Tools. We appreciate both of them for sponsoring and helping us put this uh, show on. And with that, uh, we want to thank you for listening to another episode of Prep for Impact. Thanks for listening to another episode of Prep for Impact. Just as a reminder, everything you heard on this episode and every episode of Prep for Impact are just the opinions of the speakers, whether that's the host or the guest, and they're not the official position of either the Green Beret Foundation, their employers, the Department of Defense, or anyone else. And with that disclaimer in mind, I want to take a quick second to give you my opinion on the best way to prep for impact. Across my life, whether it was as a Green Beret or personally, I found no more secret weapon than to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, my Savior, and to walk His path rather than mine. And so if you're curious about that, or if you ever want to talk, my DMs are always open. Thanks for listening to Prep for Impact.